Do you think many of us, many humans, will eventually go into space and live on other planets? Um, I don't think many humans will because the practical need for humans in space is being eroded, of course, by the advance in robotics. There's no, no practical case for sending people. It's far cheaper to send robots. And if I was an American, I wouldn't support the NASA manned space program funded by taxpayers. I would leave it to the private sector. And of course, we know companies like Elon Musk, SpaceX, Jeff Bezos's Blue or Origin program, and they are going to be able to send people into space. And the important point is that they'll be able to take bigger risks than NASA can with tax-supported civilians. And of course, if you look back at the history of space exploration by humans, then apart from the Apollo program, which was a, a wonderful uh, event, uh, massively financed, but done for reasons of superpower rivalry, then the shuttle was launched 135 times. There were two crashes, each of which was a national trauma. That's because it had been presented as something rather safe. Test pilots and adventurers are happy with a 2% failure rate or higher. And so my scenario would be that the first people to go to Mars will be risk-taking adventurers, accepting that they may have one-way tickets or have a small chance of return, and uh, they will be probably financed or sponsored by one of these private companies. And I think we would cheer them on because uh, they will develop a small colony on Mars and they will be the pioneers who will be the first to really experimentally use these new opportunities of human enhancement and changing human beings away from the regulators it adapted to their new habitat. Living on the moon and living on Mars it would be hellish wouldn't it? I mean it, it's, yes. it's nowhere near the paradise no, I think some people no, think. No uh, absolutely and I think uh, um, uh, nowhere in the solar system anywhere is as comfortable as the top of Everest or the South Pole. And so that's why I think the idea of mass emigration is um, a bit crazy. In fact, um, Jeff Bezos has the idea of living in huge um, cylinders um, up in space. This was an idea that was promoted by a chap called O'Neill back in the 1970s. But here again, um, you have a sort of synthetic California suburb in some huge uh, cylinder. But again, it's not as good as living down here. And so uh, I think we have to bear in mind that space is not a place for human beings, except for adventurers, the kind of people who do go to the South Pole and um, top of Everest. If you could visit one extraterrestrial body, mm -hmm. which one would you go to? Which one interests you the most? I think one of my scientific motivations would be to understand whether life is unique to the Earth, whether the rest of the cosmos is, is awaiting our progeny, as it were. And one of the most interesting places in our solar system is uh, Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn, which has an icy surface and water underneath. And I'd like to know, is there anything crawling or swimming under the ocean? But one of the most exciting things in astronomy has been the realization that most stars are orbited by retinues of planets, just as the sun is orbited by the Earth and the other familiar planets. And we have inferred these indirectly, but in 20 years, we have telescopes that will be powerful enough to image the light from one of these Earth-like planets around a nearby star and get some feeling by analyzing the light whether there's a biosphere there. That would be very exciting. And of course, if you find life on Enceladus, that would tell us that if life has originated twice independently in our solar system, it must be common feature everywhere else. So I'd like to know if there's life there. And um, uh, I think we want to study these exoplanets. And as a long-term goal, um, uh, in the year 2068, which will be the centenary of the iconic picture of the Earth taken from, uh, fr from the moon, um, I think we could hope to have an image of another planet, another Earth, orbiting another star. That's a realistic goal if we have by then huge telescopes in space made by robotic fabricators, very lightweight under zero G. So that's my vision and my hope. So how do you, how do you think we might evolve, if that's the right word, in the future? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, of course, there's going to be a big gap between what could be done 
and what we feel ought to be done on ethical or prudential grounds. But as to what could be done, then I think it's clear that by the middle of this century, we will have the capacity to analyze the human genome to decide which combination of genes is responsible for various desirable characteristics. And knowing that, it will also be possible to synthesize a genome with those qualities. So that's the sense in which designer babies will become realistic. But the other possibility, and uh, this is advocated by some AI enthusiasts, is that at some stage we will be able to uh, link our brains more intimately to something electronic and eventually perhaps uh, download ourselves uh, into something electronic. Uh, this, uh, I think, is very conjectural, um, but uh, uh, the high priest of this is a guy called Ray Kurzweil, who now works for Google, and he wrote a book called The Age of Spiritual Machines, and he thinks that eventually humans will download their brains into something electronic, um, and uh, uh, those electronic entities will have human general intelligence capabilities and be able to design still more intelligent machines. This is his idea. Um, and he, incidentally, is, um, uh, I think, already in his 60s, and he um, is one of these people who wants to be frozen when he dies so that he can be resurrected uh, when it's possible to uh, uh, download him or give him immor immortality. But there are these ideas uh, that uh, um, human uh, intelligence may be matched by something electronic. But and of course, something that we've created specifically to download ourselves into rather than design general AI from the ground well, up? Well, I think that there's a difference between designing uh, uh, general AI, which uh, already obviously can hugely surpass human abilities in, in many respects because of the greater speed with which it operates. You know, the, uh, uh, the machine that beat the, wo the world chess champion and the best chess program in three hours, being just given the rules of chess, did so because it could play against itself um, thousands of times every minute and so it gained expertise and that's the kind of, of speed which is advances and incidentally um, that's an as aspect of AI which has huge potential in science because it will be possible to explore lots of options for drug development by doing that and maybe find a high temperature conductor and maybe help theorists like me to understand if string theory is correct because the, the math is very complicated and, and convoluted so that that's can be, can be done, but also on the practical level it's fairly clear that um, uh, computers, because they can uh, absorb information and process it very quickly, will be able to run efficient electric grids, traffic systems, and would incidentally allow the Chinese to have a fully planned economy of the kind that Marx could only dream of. There's already 80% of financial transactions in China are done electronically, and they probably know the stock in every shop, etc. So all the things which, of course, impeded the Soviet Union in running an efficient system are now um, uh, remedied by having all the information available on a processing speed. So those are the, the kind of uses which are uh, available to a us if we have AI. But that's not the same as downloading a human brain. Uh, and, and of course, there's still the philosophical question of whether these um, electronic entities, even if they are superhuman or human in many respects, will um, be, be human, will they be conscious or not, yes, or will they just be zombies? And um, uh, some people would say this doesn't matter, it's like asking does a submarine swim, it's just a semantic question. Whereas I think it does matter, and for instance it matters if we think about the far future, where it's possible that um, uh, we will be superseded by electronic entities which can then roam into stellar space. And um, when I wrote an article once about this in a newspaper, I got feedback of two opposite kinds. Some people said, well, isn't it wonderful these uh, uh, super superhuman entities uh, will um, be able to appreciate the universe? But others said, well, um, if these entities don't have self-awareness and consciousness, then isn't it tragic that there be no intelligence is left, able to appreciate the wonder and beauty of the universe. So the question of whether these entities are conscious is, of course, important in, the, in, in that fundamental sense. Um, but if, uh, when we think about the fairly short-term use of robots, um, uh, we know they're going to distort the labor market, they're going to take over many, many kinds of manufacturing. Not all blue-collar jobs, I think gardening and plumbing will be very hard to mechanize and automate. Really? Um, because they're so uh, non-routine. 
Um, on the other hand, many um, so-called white-collar jobs like radiography, uh, computer coding, um, routine legal work, etc., will be uh, computable. Um, so. Uh, what's going to happen, of course, is that, as we know, we have to find new work for those who are displaced. And um, uh, I think the win-win situation would be achieved if we had a massive redistribution of wealth, so that the money earned by the robots and those who own them is used to set up a huge number of publicly funded and dignified jobs as carers for old people and teachers assistants and things of that kind, where the human element is crucial. And um, uh, uh, for a human being, it's surely more dignified to be doing a job like that than working in an Amazon warehouse or in a call center. Uh, so it's far better. And I think um, uh, although robots can help with caring, I mean, maybe uh, bedpan rituals are better performed by a machine than a human carer. But I think when we're old, we want to have someone who really does care about us. Mm. We've got to be a human being. And to take another example, uh, uh, if, if, you're, if you've got a child and, uh, and you don't want a machine to read to them, if someone's reading them an emotional story, it's got to be someone who really has empathy and resonates with them. So those are the kind of jobs which we never want to see fully replaced by machines. And uh, uh, the challenge is to ensure that the resources earned by the robots are used to set up a huge number of jobs to meet the now hugely unmet demand for carers for old people and for teachers assistants etc. So y your late colleague Stephen Hawking said we should try and leave the earth within 30 years mm. to um, avoid being wiped out by overpopulation and climate change. Mm. You think differently? Um, I, I think that's a dangerous delusion. We've got to deal with the earth's problems here on earth and uh, uh, population of course uh, uh, is rising but it's leveling off and uh, I think we must hope that world population um, doesn't increase beyond 2050 and starts to go down again. I think the optimum population of the world is probably less than it is now. Um, but I think um, mass emigration is a dangerous and crazy delusion in my opinion. I think you were two years apart when you were studying, but did you have anything to do with him when you b were both younger? And I wondered if oh, you, you did. You, you, what was he like and um, you, what was yes, your relationship? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, uh, um, I, I was in the research group with Stephen Hawking, I joined two years later, and that was a time when his disease was just starting, and um, uh, uh, he hadn't got his PhD, and of course it was then unclear he'd ever even finished his PhD. And I like to say that uh, although I'm an astronomer used to large numbers, few are as large as the odds I'd then have given against him living 50 years more, and of course achieving such huge success. And um, it was an extraordinary achievement against the odds that he managed to last so long and um, achieve so much and become an iconic figure um, because of his uh, uh, work, his research. He was uh, one of the people who did um, uh, a great deal to advance our knowledge of relativity, one of the leading people who uh, developed Einstein's ideas further and also he became an iconic figure um, through his triumph over disability and of course curiosity about his personality led to his books becoming bestsellers and um, uh, he amazingly lived to be 76 and um, I had the privilege of giving the address in Westminster Abbey at his memorial service. So you mentioned that he's an iconic figure and will always be and I, I wonder what you thought of, what do you think of today's iconic figures in the world of space? I'm talking about Elon Musk and mm. Jeff Bezos. Yes. Mm. What, do you, what do you make of them? Um, well, I cheer them on. I mean, I think it's, a, it's, it's very good that they are developing programs that will send people into space, um, and uh, um, there will be um, accidents, and they, they will hopefully only launch into space the kind of people prepared to accept high risks. And I think it's very important that these ventures are called space adventure and not space tourism, because the word space tourism implies something routine. And if that's the expectation, then the accidents which are inevitable will then be traumatic, rather like the accidents of the American Space Shuttle, uh, which were national traumas because that had been presented as being safe. So I think uh, the private sector space endeavors um, have to emphasize that those who go up are taking big risks. 
just as were, of course, the Apollo astronauts in the early days, if one thinks of how primitive their technology was. Elon Musk certainly is seen as very cavalier, and I wonder whether you think you need that kind of personality to you know, much take such big strides in, in exploration and science. Well, of course, Elon Musk is is not just associated with the space project, he's associated with his, his cars and everything else, so he's the nearest we have to a 21st century Brunel, in my opinion, and I think we have to admire his achievements. Of all the risks that we face, climate change, overpopulation and, and the food mm -hmm. production, uh, biological warfare, ordinary warfare, sheer stupidity, what do you fear the most? Well, in the long run, I, I do worry about whether we can avoid serious irreversible changes to the, uh, the world's climate and biodiversity. Um, but I do worry that uh, the world is becoming less easily, gov easily governable because individuals have the power to create devastation on a scale of a city, even a nation, even globally, by bio and cyber techniques. And I do worry that we will have a bumpy ride, which would be rather hard to, to avoid this happening. One occurrence is too many, and I think it's going to be very hard. The global village will have its village idiots, and they will now have a global range, and that was never true in the past. So I worry about that. I also worry that our world is so interconnected in terms of communication, supply chains, regulation, and all that, uh, that any uh, local catastrophe is going to cascade globally. We know that the financial sector is global, but that'll be true of other things, pandemics and all the rest of it. So I worry about that. And another thing I worry about is that um, society is more fragile in that expectations are so high. And there could be a social breakdown if things go badly. To take a contrast, in the Middle Ages, there were um, towns where half the population died in the Black Death. The rest went on fatalistically. If we had some sort of pandemic now, a natural one, not necessarily an engineered one, I think that once the number of cases overwhelm the capacity of hospitals, which might be less than 1% of the population uh, succumbing, then there will be a risk of social breakdown, because everyone will clamor for treatment which they knew existed and they couldn't achieve. So I think my worry is that expectations are so high that the breakdown of social order uh, will happen uh, at a lower level of catastrophe than would have been the case in the past. And another um, new uh, concern I would have is that if inequalities persist between privileged countries and those in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, uh, this is a recipe for long-term instability uh, because um, uh, those in Africa now um, if they are trapped in poverty, are going to have a hard job getting out of it because they can't do what the Asian tigers did and undercut Western manufacturing costs because robots do that. So, so that ladder's been removed for them. And uh, so that's harder for them to escape poverty. But also, even if they don't have proper sanitation, they do have mobile phones, so they know what they're missing. And I think... Uh, naturally they will be uh, uh, outraged at the injustice of their fate. And so I think given that the population in countries like Africa is growing faster than in Europe, or maybe five times that of Europe by the middle of the century, uh, then I think unless Western nations, for reasons which are not purely altruistic, really do what they can to increase the development rate in Africa, then uh, we will face instability and the risk of mega versions of the uh, uh, migrations of boat people, which we're seeing already. So it's in everyone's interest to ensure that the gap between the parts of the world which are now lacking behind technologically and the rest is narrowed, not widened. And also that the new technologies are used in ways that minimize inequality, not which enhance it. And of course, uh, medical techniques in the last hundred years have benefited the developing world by cutting infectious diseases, etc. And we've got to make sure that uh, that trend continues and we don't have 
enhancement techniques available only to the wealthy. Martin, thank you so much mm. for your time. Thank you for having me on the programme. Thank you.